forget how adaptable we are as humans. There are certain anxieties that are specific to travel that predate the phones. Like, how am I going to get around when I'm in Buenos Aires? Well, you learn the bus system the same way as any other place. I think we don't give ourselves enough credit for being able to just do it, to figure things out and to make things happen. This is Ralph Potts. He's a veteran travel writer who's visited more than 100 countries over the last 30 years. He's also the author of five books, including the wildly successful Vagabonding, an uncommon guide to the art of long-term world travel, which get this, inspired Tim Ferriss to write The 4-Hour Workweek. Have an eight-hour phone fast. Have a 24-hour phone fast. Our phone doesn't know how to smell. So if we smell, if we're walking through the street and we smell something delicious, maybe that's where you should eat. So many levels of life, including travel, we're sort of looking at this little screen instead of looking out and around and using our all five senses. The world is a pretty awesome place, the real organic world. And being lost is something that's kind of fun sometimes. And being found when you're lost is not that hard. Being bored is something, it's a moment in life where it's asking you to pay closer attention to the world. And oftentimes boredom is a way to deepen our experience of a place. One piece of advice I often give to people is you really have to slow down because often you take this work mentality to the road and it's like, I'm going to do 10 things in this city and I'm going to check everything off my list. And it's like, whoa, 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 slow down. Spend an afternoon in the village square and, and sort of enjoy the sunshine. The world isn't a checklist of things to tick off. And part of the joy of getting out and traveling is that you're breaking out of that mindset and you're not just collecting a bunch of experiences. What is vagabonding? Well, vagabonding, as I define it in the book of the same name, is taking time off of your regular life to travel in earnest, to travel long term. And long term can mean any number of things. It could be six weeks if that's how much time you have, or one year, or six months, or six years if you have that much time. But the idea is that it's more than just a vacation, which is sort of the way we often think about travel. It's it's about sort of taking your life on the road for an extended period of time, not escaping from your life at home, but sort of escaping into a new possibility of what your life can be by living in other places, be it on the other side of the world or even traveling close to home. But I think at, at its heart, it's about traveling long term. Huh. You know, for me, travel I've found has always been the most inspirational thing I can do. And I often think of like, oh, I can't wait to go here in Europe. Or I can't wait to go to Japan or I want to experience all these different parts. And yet, in business, like my career has taken me to some of the most boring places on earth, you know, like there's nothing wrong with Cleveland, Ohio, but I spent a bunch of days in Cleveland, Ohio and I loved it. And it's like, I realized that like, if I'm going to the, you know, the, the mountains of Pennsylvania or Cleveland, Ohio, or, or what would be considered like boring places, I still like, no matter where I am, I have fun. I explore, I, I get to experience different cultures, even if they're slightly different. And I'm inspired by being in these different environments. What is it about travel or picking up who we are and taking ourselves somewhere else that, that shifts that mindset and gets us out of everyday life? Well, it gets us out of our habits and routines. It really puts us into an almost childlike state where we're not really sure how to get around. And on the other side of the world, we're not really sure how to communicate sometimes. And the food is really new and, and experiences are really new. But Cleveland is a great example. Just because I went there, I went there and watched a baseball game once, but it was fun. You know, I went to a bar afterwards and I was talking to Cleveland people and of course, they have the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame there. But it's I, I think every place has its own places that are unique. And when you're talking about places that are air quotes boring, I think any city can be boring if you're in the beige hotel at the edge of the city, <laughs> you know, doing your business and not really putting yourself into what the place has to offer. And I think those beige hotels are there for a reason. They sort of recreate a home environment so that you can do your business in, in a way that's comfortable and not too dissimilar. But part of the point of travel is to get out of your comfort zone and to be in a place that is unique to itself. You know, Cleveland is a, is a good beer city, for example. There's good food in Cleveland. I think any place in the world where you go, just walking around for a couple of hours is going to put you into that place in a way that that sweet but bland beige hotel at the edge of the city isn't going to allow you. So be it close to home or around the world, I think the travel really allows you to reset and to have to take those that, that childlike a mindset to a new place and open yourself up to learning and, and, and change and surprise. In the first question I asked you, you said whether it's six weeks or whether it's a month or whether it's six months or six years, as much time as you have, I think almost everyone listening would say, I don't have any time at all. <laughs> so like biggest challenge has to be, how do I carve out enough time to be able to explore the world and do this? And, and secondly, like, I don't have any money for this, mm -hmm. right? Like, like those, are, those have to be, like you must be tired of answering the same questions, but those 
are the same questions that we all immediately think of. Well, those are great questions because they take it right into the heart of vagabonding, which is the idea of what wealth is, you know, because we often see riches in terms of our material objects, but wealth is the ability to live our lives in the way that we want to live. It's it's the ability to, to be our best selves. And so I think sometimes, one thing I say again and again when people want to talk about vagabonding is that time is our truest form of wealth. And it's really a matter of creating time in our lives, using what money we have, creating enough time for us to get out of our home routines and travel in earnest. And I think one key of that is oftentimes when, I mean, you can travel across Asia for probably cheaper each month than it would be to live in Toronto or New York, for example. There are some economies where it's just not as expensive to have housing and food and transportation. And we don't realize that sometimes. I think sometimes we approach our travels as consumers, that travel is something we buy in the same way that we buy our clothes or our running shoes or our, you know, electronic equipment. When in fact, through things like simplicity, you know, we can adjust our daily routines so that we're like saving $20 a week. Well, $20 a week for a year can add up, you know, and you can take that to a part of the world like Southeast Asia or Central America where your dollar goes further and really, really travel in earnest in such a way that you can make use of that. And I, and I think there's, there's oftentimes that we're not given much vacation time, at least in North America. Sometimes we're just not given that much free time, but finding ways to carve out a bit of time within that, be it through a, a sabbatical of some sort or of just asking your boss for more time or of, or of creatively quitting in such a way that you can make that dream trip happen. Because I think sometimes we for, defer so much of our life to the future that we're obsessed with our, our present life is so much about sort of building up this nest egg and sort of creating a comfortable life for ourselves further down the line. When in fact, let's think about how we can make our lives better now. And maybe you won't be able to save enough money for that dream trip for two years. But oftentimes when you're at home working, saving money, once you realize that that travel is going to be something you're going to do, then it becomes a part of your present moment. It's more exciting to do work, even work that isn't fun, when you realize that, hey, in two years, I'm going to be on the other side of the world. I'm going to be hiking uh, through the jungle in Colombia, or I'm going to be going down a, a river in China. In that way, that it can be a, a conversation with your life that, in such a way that it, you don't defer your truest life to uh, the future in a way that we do far too much in North America. Yeah. And, you know, I think, I think for anyone who's really ambitious and, and a high achiever, that's going to be the case. You know, like I, I remember the marshmallow test when I came across that, the idea that, you know, as kids that they would sit people down and they would say, you know, like, don't eat this marshmallow for 10 minutes. And if you don't, you'll get two. And then they tracked all the people later in life. You know, some kids ate the marshmallow right away, instant gratification. Others would sit there and stare at it, smell it, you know, like really put it off as long as possible. And then when they circled around with these kids later in life, they realized that the kids who were able to put off instant gratification were often, quote unquote, more successful. I always saw myself, frankly, as a skill, right? Like as an entrepreneur, as a business owner, as someone who has always been responsible for my own income, I have always been proud of the fact that I will sacrifice today for a better tomorrow. And yet that, that tomorrow never seemed to really come, right? That hedonic treadmill that, that we're on where it's always like further and further and further in the future. And we almost don't give ourselves permission, you know, like to be able to take time off or to be able to do these things. How, like with everyone that you've spoken to and everything that you've written and the fact that you've dedicated your entire career and life to trying to help us break out of this cage that we're in, is it just like a quick switch in our brain we need to, to flick? Or is there something more that makes us feel kind of caged in well, I think to stretch out that that um, marshmallow analogy, it is finding that balance. I think it's it's good to um, to delay gratification in such a way that it enriches your life. But I think all, far too often, by the time we get to those two marshmallows, those two metaphorical marshmallows, it's like, well, maybe I'll wait longer and I'll have four marshmallows and then I'll have yeah. eight. And it's like, well, when are you going to enjoy the marshmallows? Or you have those two marshmallows and you're eating them and multitasking. You know, you're, you're eating the marshmallow <laughs> while you're doing other, you know, thankless work stuff in the hopes that you can get two more marshmallows further down the line. It's like all too often, and again, I'm speaking metaphorically, we don't allow ourselves to actually enjoy the marshmallows. We're so we're so obsessed with the idea of doubling our marshmallow wealth that we forget that the point is to be in that place and to be savoring that experience. And so, 
it's totally a balance. It's, it's a matter of realizing that for all the hard work we're doing now, and I think hard work is important. And in fact, in my first book, Vagabonding, I have an entire chapter about how you really have to earn your freedom, that it, it's, it's more enjoyable to be on this great, amazing world journey if you've earned the money to do it. I think sometimes there's some unhappy travelers, the least happy travelers are the people who are taking their, their family money, taking their parents' money, and they're not really sure what to do because they have no connection to uh, the money that that earned this journey. I think saving money is um, is a part of that. But once you spend the money, you really have to live fully. You have to break out of work mode because again, you don't want to be multitasking mm. while you're eating the marshmallow. You have to let yeah. that go away. And this is not an easy, it's not just a switch that you can turn off. Oftentimes like the first week of that six, six week trip or that six month trip is sort of a, a tough transition time, not only in terms of culture shock, but just relaxing and sitting still. And one piece of advice I often give to people is you really have to slow down because often you take this work mentality to the road and it's like, I'm going to do 10 things in this city and I'm going to check everything off my list. And it's like, whoa, 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 slow down. Spend an afternoon in the, in the village square and, and sort of enjoy the sunshine and watch people for a while. It's not, the world isn't a checklist of things to, to, to tick off. And part of the joy of getting out and traveling is that you're breaking out of that mindset and you're not just collecting a bunch of experiences, but you're, you're breathing in and letting life breathe a little bit. Huh. You know, a few weeks ago, my daughter turned 16 back in October. And, and her gift was that I was going to take her to her favorite K-pop concert. And we looked at local tickets. And, and frankly, buying tickets in kind of the Toronto area was just ridiculously expensive. And for the same price, I could fly her to Atlanta. And we could spend three days together. We could fly down together. We could go to the concert. We could spend the time together, all that stuff. And so I, I talked to my wife and I say, can, you know, can we do this? Um, you know, are you cool if I just take off with, with Rachel, my oldest daughter, for for three days and we go off and do this. And she's like, yeah, I think we can make the schedule work with all the other kids and everything. And as soon as we booked it, the first thing I, I thought of is like, okay, how can I set up some meetings in Atlanta? You know, like, who do I know? How can I set stuff up? How can I justify for myself the time because I'm taking three days to do this? And frankly, the concert is like an evening. I have all this other time. And I was telling someone this and they're like, Mark, you're an idiot. You're stupid. Like, like your daughter doesn't want to sit at a coffee shop on her phone while you busy, you take meetings. Like you're giving your daughter a gift, spend time with her. And I was like, oh, ha, I am an idiot because I was trying to figure out how to make this the most efficient thing possible. So that way the time away from work could provide an ROI back for the investment. And, and frankly, we, you know, we did the trip. It was amazing. But the entire time I still felt guilty. Like I, I've, it wasn't that like I felt guilty for spending time with my daughter. When we were on downtime, I felt guilty for not using that time for work. Hmm. And it was interesting because I don't know, I haven't figured out how to let go yet, I think. And you were talking about, you know, the first weekend, you know, you're in that, you're in that zone where you're like trying to make things as efficient as possible. With the amount of travel that you've done, is there a way that like I could slip into this a little easier. I can let go of some of these things. I could help allocate the time and just be like, you know what? Because this affects us not only in terms of travel, but a lot of us struggle with this where family time is family time and vacation time is vacation time and travel is travel time and work time is work time. Like, It seems to me that this is more of a universal thing that we could all get better at. Absolutely. And, and it applies to so many categories. And it's even harder now than it used to be, because now you have this smartphone that is smarter than you, like the, the, the algorithmic <laughs> apps. They know that they, they have a better hold on your attention than sometimes the human beings in your life. Right. And I think sometimes there's so many things that we defer to the future. And one thing is parenthood. I think one task of raising a child is preparing them for their future. I mean, giving them the upbringing so that when they're adults, they can be independent and happy and able to make good decisions. One risk of that is that we aren't enjoying those moments. When they're 18 months old, we have that moment where we just look in their eyes and that is the point, you know. When they're 16 years old, a more complicated time of life, but sharing that experience in Atlanta is huge. When, when you first mentioned K-pop, I thought, oh, they're going to go to Korea instead. <laughs> <laughs> that, that, that's, that's next. That's right. the future. <laughs> well, it's so fun because 
it, when you go to a place, it becomes connected to your life. And as a guy who lived in Korea for a couple of years in his mid twenties, I love seeing K-pop. It's like this country that I came to love by living there. Suddenly it is the pop culture behemoth around the world. And the fact that of course your daughter is in love with K-pop because I saw, but, I saw the but, early. But we're doing, we're like, we're sprinkling little inspiration points. Like I take her to Korean restaurants mm. when we were traveling. She's been learning Korean, mm. like, like on Duolingo. And when we were traveling, I said, I said, like, I want to go to Japan and I want to go to Korea and I want to go to Vietnam and I want to like go to these places. And my wife isn't really that interested. And I was like, well, maybe we can go together. So like, there's this like, this dream, but it's not scheduled. It's like, we're kind of taking baby steps towards it. But it is this thing that's kind of like, maybe it would be nice. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, well, I think every place, every part of the equation counts. And actually, I, I talk in my new book, uh, The Vagabond's Way, I talk about how, like, I came to love Korean. My wife, when I'm in a bad mood, she takes me out for Korean food because she knows it's my comfort food, right? Uh, and so I, I will always be in dialogue with Korea because I lived there for a, a few years. And your daughter will probably be in dialogue with Korea, even if she doesn't go there. I think she should, because it, it was a part of popular culture that really affected her life. You know, I think when I was, my wife is an actress, when she was young, she grew up watching like British dramas on, on PBS, on public television here in the United States. And that affected her desire to go to graduate school in London, you know, that she grew up and she felt part English. And I think in this day and age, that's such a normal thing that we grow up in a global world and we fall in love with distant places. When I was a kid, the best, I was a middle distance runner in Kansas in the United States. The best middle distance runners in the world were Kenyan. And so to, to this day, I was associate, I have this fond image of Kenya, even though I've hardly spent time there. I want to go there in earnest more in the future because Kenyans had this excellence when it came to track and field. And so absolutely it becomes a part of the equation, but going back to your original point, you have to allow yourself to enjoy the moment when you're there, you know, that, that it's really easy to plan a bunch of meetings. It's, it, it's really easy to not break out of work mode because it's, because we're trapped in this, in these habits. And I think maybe when you go to Atlanta, it's a matter of keeping your smartphone at the hotel, for example, or finding ways to not be connected. I call it the electronic umbilical cord to your work life back home. That if you don't have to work in Atlanta, if you don't have to multitask that, well then don't because your daughter will only be 16 year old years old for one year. And those three days are a precious gift, right? Not just to spend time with your daughter, but Atlanta, which is a really cool city. I mean, that's a, this, that's a really unique part of the United States. And so I think that there are other philosophical strategies for keeping yourself in the moment, but one very easy technological strategy for embracing the moment is to turn off your phone, <laughs> turn off your phone. Yeah. And, and, we're in, the, we're in the age now where people go, oh, turn off your phone. Oh my God. But, but actually, yeah, you know, have an eight hour phone fast, have a 24 hour phone fast. And you'll find out that it's actually kind of fun to not have it. There'll be some anxiety in those first hours because we almost reflexively reach towards our pockets to pull out that black mirror and look into it and see what we're missing. Well, but what you're actually missing in using Atlanta as an example is the chance to really spend some awesome, amazing time with your daughter. Um, and she will, she will train measure that in the same way that you will uh, moving forward. And so it, it's really important to break out of that electronic feedback loop and really embrace life as we have it in the present moment. Yeah. Back in um, 2006, I switched job. I, I had a job where they gave me a pager and a, and a company phone, which was like a mic phone, which I don't know why they got rid of mic phones. It was the greatest thing in the world. When I left that job and I went to the next one, I had given up my cell phone my personal cell phone because they had given me one. And there was an 18 month period where I didn't have a cell phone or a Blackberry or anything. Wow. And I remember at the time in 2006, feeling crazy. <laughs> like, like not like what, what if something happened with traffic and what, and I used to have to like, if I was in traffic or running late, I'd have to pull over at a pay phone and like try and call my uh. wife and stuff and get her on the phone and everything. And at the time I remember thinking, this is this, how can I live this way? And then I just did. And mm -hmm. it was amazing. Mm -hmm. And I loved it. And I think back to some of those days and I wonder if I could go back to that. I'm not, I'm not sure I could, but, but you know, we can acclimatize to anything. I, I mean, it would, it would be amazing not to have that thing in our pocket all the time, wouldn't it? <laughs> yeah. Well, I love the phrase. And then I just did because, yeah, I, I think we forget how adaptable we are as humans. I, I mean, I've been advising people about travel since before the smartphone age. And there's certain anxieties that are specific to travel that predate the phones. Like, how am I going to learn the bus? System? How am I going to get around when I'm in Buenos Aires? Well, you learn the bus system the same way as any other place. We don't give ourselves enough credit for being able to just figure things, just do it, to figure things out and to make things happen. 
And this can happen in the electronic realm as much as the travel realm. And oftentimes travel is a great way to break ourselves out of those habits. When I travel, I don't buy a data plan when I go overseas. I'll put my phone on Wi-Fi so I can use it in my home base. But then when I'm walking around, I don't want to steal from my experience by checking down and sending text messages and seeing what the latest thing on Twitter or Instagram is. And the thing of it is, is that we have anxieties. I think our smartphones realize that anxiety is a good tool for keeping us looking at our smartphones all the time. It's the attention economy, right? But we can just do it. We can just put it down. And, and, and after that small period of anxiety, you realize that the world is a pretty awesome place, the real organic world. And being lost is something that's kind of fun sometimes. And being found when you're lost is not that hard. Being bored is something, it's a moment in life where it's asking you to pay closer attention to the world. And oftentimes boredom is a way to deepen our experience of a place. Loneliness is another thing that comes up oftentimes. When people travel, they feel lonely. Well, loneliness is good. Like I'm an introvert. Travel allows me to come to terms with loneliness in such a way that I become more outgoing when I travel. And so I think willing ourselves to just be more independent of our phones, willing ourselves to just be braver in a town that we don't really know or a city that we don't know too well and learning as we go. It's great. I think I, in my new book, I have a chapter about how I was in Bukitini, this town in Sumatra in Indonesia, and I crowdsourced how to find um, rendang, which is like the local de delicacy. And so I'm walking to my crowdsourced restaurant, walking through the market. There's all these Indonesian people there and I eat at the Rendon restaurant, I was the only person there. And then I, it, was, it was okay. And then I walked back and realized I just crowdsourced an eating recommendation. And then I walked through a crowd of local people eating <laughs> to find this TripAdvisor place that was empty. I mean, the tourist buses go there and apparently they like it. But I realized that instead of looking for an actual crowd, I crowdsourced dinner. And I ignored the fact that people were really happy eating their Indonesian food in an Indonesian place with other Indonesian people. And so since then, I've really realized that looking for crowds is the old fashioned way of crowdsourcing. You're in a new place. Where, where's the market? Where are the restaurants? Are local people I, eating I was going to say, you went to an empty restaurant. I was like, Ooh, that's breaking rule number one. <laughs> well, 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 that was it is that I had, I had this abstract notion of what dinner was, what Rendong was supposed to look like. And it had great reviews. And I'm sure some meals where they were good, but it's like, wait a second, the people who live here probably know some good places to eat. And it probably sometimes doesn't involve Rendong. And so if a restaurant is full of people who seem happy and healthy and food is coming out hot and delicious, maybe you don't need to have a plan before you go out and find something to eat. You can just walk down the street and find a restaurant full of happy people at mealtime. And so that metaphorically can apply to a lot of different things that oftentimes we're making abstract decisions based on this little square on our phone. When if we look up here, instead of looking down at our phone, we look up here and our phone doesn't know how to smell, right? So if we smell, if we're walking through, through, through the street and we smell something delicious, maybe that's where you should eat, right? And so in so many, in so many levels of life, including travel, we're sort of looking at this little screen instead of looking out and around and using our all five senses to tell us where to do, where to eat, what, what to do, and, and what, what is enjoyable. And, and again, to stretch it even further, I'm, I'm sure there's apps that tell you various meetups and, and activities in a, in a given city, but just keep your eyes open. Uh, is there a line at this theater? Is there a soccer game going on at this village square? What can you do? Well, you don't have to decide in advance. You can just walk into an experience and we don't give ourselves permission to do that so much. And travel is a great place, a great opportunity to just sort of wander into an experience that we didn't know was happening until we're in it. Yeah, I love this so much because what you're describing is the way that I want to live. And I feel like maybe I'm getting better at it. But, you know, I can think of a few movies, a few films, some TV shows, you know, I remember watching Joshua Jackson, the uh, the Canadian actor, but the actor was in a movie called One Week, which was this Canadian independent film. But it was about a man who figured, found out that he was diagnosed with brain cancer. And he was essentially facing two, three months to live. And he walks out of the appointment with the doctor, buys uh, an old used motorcycle and just escapes. Like just spends the one week heading west with no direction, with no plan, no cell phone, breaking down and, you know, freaking his family out and everyone else because he's just like, this is it. And it's not a happy movie by any means, but I've watched the movie so many times because there's something almost romantic about this idea of just like going somewhere. You know, I talked to my wife about like, I would love to show up at the airport and just say like, we're going here. 
right? Like, obviously it's warm or it's cold. So you kind of pack up appropriately, but like, mm-hmm. we're just, okay. Uh, apparently, you know, we're going to, I don't know, Mexico city. I didn't realize, you know, or whatever. Like I have all of these ideas and I love the idea of, of all of them. And, and yet it's almost really romantic compared to like then sitting there for seven hours waiting for a layover or, you know, swatting the bugs away because you find yourself in the middle of nowhere or, or eating food that makes you terribly sick because you're experiencing street food for the first time. So um, how do we close that gap between the romantic notion of what travel's really like and then the reality of it? Well, we just have to tell ourselves that we're that we're not consumers. We're not leaving a Yelp review for a Mexico City, right? That anything in life, I think, yeah, we have this idea that we deserve good service and a good experience and that the experience is bad unless it goes out exactly like we thought it would be. When in fact, sometimes you can learn a lot by being sick for a day in, in a place when you eat street really? food. Really? Like, like what? Well, it's just, it's you become into the... It's, it's almost a spiritual moment of realizing, I think being sick allows you to appreciate your health. And being sick actually as a traveler is one way to sit still for a while. That being sick, you can sit on one street and watch the street go by. If you're only going to the corner coffee shop because your stomach isn't well and you're, you're afraid that there'll be a problem if you go to the next village over or another part of the city, you can sit in that cafe and watch the city go by. You can sit still and, instead of moving and let the city flow through you for a little bit. And so I think sometimes um, if we see places as things that can either satisfy us or disappoint us in the way, in the manner of a consumer product, rather than just going in and throwing ourselves into the situation, then then we're selling ourselves short a little bit. I think it's, it's about mindset. Oftentimes you were talking about the movie and about the guy who is realizes that death is coming soon. And so he gives himself permission, you know, to take this road trip. Well, Death is coming for all of us. Why don't we? Why don't we find a way to give ourselves permission? Movies are, are great metaphors for this. I in the new, in my new book, I mentioned Fight Club. You know, it's the idea that these this guy is trapped in his Edward Norton character is trapped in this consumerist life where he just is collecting his new set of IKEA furniture, and he realizes to get out of this trap, he gets into fist fights. And in, and in the book, I say, well, that's sort of an absurdist. That movie is a satire. You, you don't have to get in a fist fight. You can take a one year trip. You know, if you want to be a nihilistically throw away the routines that you've been trapped in, why don't you do something gentler, like going to the other side of the world and learning something? And if you realize that, okay, the, the character in the movie was going to die on a very short term, but we're all going to die on a long term. So why not take that road trip and, and reinvent our lives a little bit? Um, and because it takes us out of that mindset, I guess that sort of safe inside the box consumer mindset about how life should be. And then breaking out of that and living life as it can be for a while, you know, living potential. And you might get some stomach sickness, but at least you're, you're getting some stomach sickness, sickness at this awesome place on the other side of the world. And to be honest, it doesn't happen that often. You know, you, you're, you're basically risking, you're daring yourself into living a life that is a little bit less predictable, but that allows you to surprise yourself with amazing experiences that you wouldn't have if you were living inside this routinized home life. So yeah. I want this so badly. Yeah, <laughs> you, you can do it. You can you're do like, it. You're like getting me so inspired. It's like, you know, you talked about England and how inspired your wife. I, I've been to England five, six times and, and my wife loves it as well. And, you know, I've, I've said, especially post pandemic, where you know, I don't have boots on the ground anymore for my company and we don't have offices anymore. And it's like, we could pick up and, and move anywhere we want, it seems. And so we can rent a place for two or three months and we can go and move there and, and, and live there and experience the life in the small town or in the cottage or whatever it might be, as opposed to the hotel room, the, you know, the, the, tourist, the touristy type areas. I suppose I just have to schedule it. <laughs> Yeah. As opposed to being this idea that inspires me to something that we can actually do. Um, I, I just need to do it, I guess. Right. You, you do, you do. And, um, you, you have to give yourself permission and then give yourself forgiveness for not having done it earlier. Uh, <laughs> but, but there's different ways of doing this. You know, the, my wife and I are both creatives. We live in, in a rural part of Kansas, you know, which is sort of the middle of nowhere, North America. Yet we have, we're in conversation with the rest of the world in a certain sense. My, I'm in, talking to you from Washington, D.C. right now. My wife is on stage in a play. In the 21st century, it's actually much easier to have our home life accord with a, a life that is far distant. You're talking to me from Canada right now. I have a Canadian friend. She's been an artist in Montreal for a long time. And she's 
it, it's frustrating because Montreal keeps getting more expensive and her, her art studios keep getting smaller as she takes what rent she has. She and her, her partner moved to the country. They moved to rural Quebec and they, they're, they, she basically gave herself wealth that, that little nest of money that, that costs that she couldn't afford too much with in Montreal now gives her this really wonderful rural life in Quebec that is completely in dialogue with Montreal and the rest of the world, but it just is this space. And so I think we're living in a time where be you, be you an artist or a business person, you can not just travel, but you can, you can geographically diversify your life in a way that's really interesting. You could, you could live in London, but you could live in a much less expensive part of rural England for a while. And, um, find ways to have that in dialogue. Or if, or if rural England is too expensive, you could go to rural Portugal or rural Morocco or other parts of, of Canada or North America. Any, I think Anywhere with high-speed internet, basically. <laughs> well, and there's more and more parts of the world that are that way. It, it's exciting. And, and my wife and I have been talking about, we've been discovering that there are other creatives in Kansas, which is not a very sexy part of the United States, but there are other people who have also decided... Yeah, I'm going to take my skills as a designer or an IT worker, and I'm going to go back to this county where my grandfather lived years ago. And for the amount of money we're spending, suddenly we have more free time every week. We're not throwing all we're not throwing our money to solve problems in an urban way. Suddenly, we've created this time wealth. To go back to that idea of wealth, we are able to um, cash out our free time in hiking all weekend or taking an extra month at the end of the an extra week at the end of the month to do to do what we want, to spend time as a family together instead of like saving up our money in the hopes that this expensive part of the world will, will give us a little bit of time later on. We'll move to a cheaper part of the world and, and organically live that wealth. And so one fun thing about our technologically attuned moment is that we can use that technology actually to create more organic time for ourselves. We can, mm -hmm. or, or more organic uh, variety for ourselves. We can live in a warm place in the winter and do the same work we would do in that cold place. My wife likes cold places. So maybe when it's really hot <laughs> in, 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 in some parts of the Hold world. On. Why does she like, I mean, does she snowmobile or cross country I, ski or I think, what? Cold I think it's, her, it's her Norwegian heritage. She just has, uh, she has Norwegian ancestry. Uh, like uh, all North Americans, she has all sorts of ancestry, but uh, she, I think she grew up also in Colorado a lot. Uh, and so she, she just likes the feeling of coldness. It makes her feel alive. You know, the, the, the Norwegians have this concept of frulitsliv, frulitsliv, I can't pronounce it. It's called outdoor living. Basically, if you're, if you're in Norway and the sun comes up at 11 and goes down at 2.30 in the afternoon in the dead of winter, you can either resent the fact that it's cold and, and dark all the time, or you can put on your boots and go out and for a hike or a ski or some sort of winter or jump in, jump in a lake, right? Some sort of experience where it's like, okay, challenge, I'm going to meet you head on. And actually they say that it's better for people's mental health. In fact, in Norway now, people, even when it's summer, Norwegians are trapped in offices all day. And so it's like, we're going to have a lunch, an hour and a half lunch. We're going to just going to hike, or we're going to, we're going to have this meeting is going to be huh. as a walking meeting. And so Norwegians, because of the, this concept of Fritzli, they have, which I'm pronouncing wrong, is they have this idea that outdoor life is going to force us to confront what other people might think this is a terrible thing, but it's like, we're going to go out hiking when it's, when it's zero degrees or when it's minus whatever, minus 10 degrees. And we're just going to make that a part of our day. And we're going to meet it head on. And that's just going to be how this day is going to be. And it's, it's a very healthy way of living. And I haven't learned it yet. I'm going to have to, I'm going to have to learn it from my wife. We haven't been married for, we've been married. We've been together for just a couple of years, but uh, I think I'm going to learn a lot from her by being fully, more fully present in the winter my, when I might be otherwise seasonally depressed. No, this winter, we're going to embrace the coldness and the darkness and make that a part of our lives too. And so in a way, it's the perfect balance. I'm more of a warm weather guy. She's more of a cold weather woman. Together, we'll, we're a pretty good team. That is awesome. You know, I noticed this spring, especially uh, in our backyard, we built this deck and stuff. And when the weather turned nice, I was like, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go outside with my laptop. And then suddenly I just found myself day after day, like working outside. Like I would, I'd go out there at like, you know, seven, eight o'clock with a cup of coffee. And then suddenly it's like 3.30 in the afternoon and I've just spent all day working outside. And then I started doing meetings from outside and like, I have like some corporate clients and they're all in their offices and stuff. And I'm, I'm like, oh, excuse me, sorry. You know, <laughs> there's a plane going by overhead or whatever. But, and, and then it was just like, I realized I just felt so good. It's gotten colder, but you're reminding me that I do hard things and uh, I should I should go back to just taking meetings 
uh, outside or walking meetings or what have you. So that's amazing. Now, one thing, one thing that I did want to touch upon because it embarrassed me when, when I came across this. It embarrassed me because I'm susceptible to this. It's the idea of the time poor. We've been talking a lot about time, 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 time. You know, the, the idea that we would, as travelers, try to jam so much in or try to check something off our list you know, I, I, I remember as a, young, as a younger boy going to Mount Rushmore because we happened to be driving across South Dakota and we said, hey, we're close, let's go. And we get to the park. And when we get to the park, we didn't realize that you have to hike to see it. And so we're like hiking and hiking and it's hot, it's August. The corner, like we round the corner to see it and we go, oh, we've seen it. And we turn around and go back to our car. You know, uh, my wife and I were in Vegas a bunch of years ago for seven days. And we're like, we want to see the Grand Canyon. So I rent a car. We drive all the way to Grand Canyon National Park in Arizona. We have lunch. We walk around for 45 minutes. We get back in our car and we drive all the way back to Vegas. (laughs) What is this idea of the time poor? And why do we do this to ourselves? Well, I I learned the phrase time poor from from John Muir. I quote him in Vagabonding and in, in the Vagabond's way as well. And I want to go back to him. But I think sometimes we view our travels in the same way that we view our work life in that it's a a bunch of things to check off the list. I mean, Mount Rushmore and the Grand Canyon are both bucket list type places. You know, they're places like, oh, when I go to the Dakotas, I'm going to go to Mount Rushmore. When I go to the American Southwest, I'm going to see the Grand Canyon. And bucket lists are good, but I think you have to realize that bucket lists get us out the door and that the things we discover by accident on the way to or at our bucket list experiences are really the gift of why we're going there. That at the end of the day, everybody takes a snapshot of from the South Rim of the Grand Canyon or of Mount Rushmore. And you can find those images online. You know, you can Photoshop yourself in if you really want to, you know, pretend you've been there. It's going to be those restaurants you stop at or the people you talk to or the the bonding with your family or the the random experiences that you have along the way that are going to enrich your life. And so I think if you're just racing through your travels from point to point on on the list, you're going to make yourself time poor. You're going to be a person who is sort of using time as this dead framework through which to cross things off lists. And uh, John Muir, the great American naturalist, in Vagabond, I quote him, I think it was Ralph Waldo Emerson, the great uh, American essayist and philosopher, came to the California Sierra Wilderness. He had like just a few days to experience it. And John Muir took him around and He said, it's a wonder we can see these trees and not wonder more. Ralph Walter Emerson said that. And then then he left uh, the next day. And and John Muir thought, well, you know, John Muir basically said, did he even see those trees? You know, he he had this really pithy phrase. It's a wonder we can see these trees and not wonder more. But it's like, why don't you stay for a month and look at the trees and then you'll have a chance to wonder more. And so I think we give lip service to the, this, this sort of spiritual philosophical level of travel without actually actualizing it. And John Muir is a great example because when he was young, we forget this. We think of John Muir. It's like, Oh, he's the nature guy. He, he spent all this time hiking in the woods and, and gave us the idea of national parks. When in fact, when he was a young man, he made a lot of money exporting grapes to Hawaii um, when he was, lived in California. But what happened is he made he made enough money to fund the life that he wanted to make. And then he started walking through the woods and, and living this more, this slower, more experienced, rich life. And at a certain point in his career, they said, well, look at this this guy, this railroad man, A.M. Harriman, this, this famous guy. He makes a lot more money than you. Um, aren't you jealous that he's making more money than, than you? And, and John Muir said, well, actually, Ian Harriman is not richer than me because I have all the money I want and he doesn't, you know, he's spending his life <laughs> making more and more money, but I have the money I want. I'm, I'm the richest guy in the world because I, I saved enough money to live the life I want. And that's, that blew me away. That's such a great example of what time wealth and time poor is. It's using what money you have to create the life that you want because like Ian e. Harriman, I'm sure he found moments. I'm sure he was happy in his own way, but he had so much money that he was the, the the idea of making more money was sort of this monster that he kept feeding into. And that was the metric. And a lot of us do this. We see this abstract money goal as, as what we're moving toward when we don't realize that how does this connect to our life? We're sort of throwing money at this abstract idea of the future or of certain things that we want to buy when in fact, well, how do you want to live? You know, how is what you're going to buy, what you're going to invest in with your monetary resources? How is it going to make your life a richer life? 
not just a, a, a rich wealth, a rich life in terms of monetary wealth, but a rich life in terms of happiness and life experience. And so sadly, it's even easier to become time poor, to really throw our lives into abstractions instead of these wonderful things, like a good slow meal or three days with, with our daughter in Atlanta, or these other experiences where we just need to give ourselves permission because it's already there. You know, we already have this money. We already have our metaphorical money we've made by selling grapes to Hawaii. And so are we going to hike through our metaphorical wilderness or are we going to throw more of our present time into a more and more abstract idea of wealth? Yeah, it's tough. It's easier said than done, but it's really, I think it can pay out if we can find ways to make our time wealth feed the life that we want to live. Um, then that's what we should do. And, and one other thing, speaking of travel, sometimes travel makes us realize what we love in life. Um, I often talk about this in the context of young people before going to university, because sometimes young people go to university without even knowing what they love or what they want to study. The British, of course, have the, the idea of the gap year, which is great. Canadians do it a fair amount too. Uh, people from the US do it less often. But oftentimes when you travel, you find out what you love and what you don't love, or you discover things that you didn't realize that you loved. Oftentimes it's as simple as food or sports or something, but you you get out into the world and you realize, oh, actually, I really like doing this. And I never at home, I didn't have a chance to think about this. But now that I'm overseas and I'm away from these home habits, I realize how rich I can live in the kitchen, you know, spending two hours making a, a, a Thai food meal or in the gym at the Muay Thai boxing gym in Thailand. Uh, I realized that I'm finding a part of myself. I'm getting my ass handed to me in kickboxing every day, but I'm growing every day. You know, I'm, I'm I, I realized that I'm a much more centered person when I'm kickboxing badly or cooking mediocre Thai food, but I'm growing in a way. And sometimes travel allows us to become time rich in a way that allows us to grow in a way that goes beyond standard education. So tell me about your latest book, The Vagabond's Way. It's 366 Meditations on Wonderlust, Discovery, and the Art of Travel. It just came out a few weeks ago. Why write this book? It, it sort of takes that vagabonding philosophy and it goes deep and ritualistic about it. Um, because each day, there's 366 chapters, each, one for each day of a leap year. So that each day gives you a quote about travel and then a reflection or a meditation about travel so that you can sort of cycle through the, a metaphorical journey over the course of the year. Whether you're actively traveling or not, you can think about this time wealth philosophy, about this time rich way of living that travel presents us with and sort of think about it over the course of a year. Now, I'm not saying that everybody has to read it one day at a time. You can read it cover to cover if you want. You can read it in, in batches. You can skip around. You can start with your birthday. You can start with you know Christmas or whatever. But the idea is that it helps you center yourself to think about these richer ways of living that travel presents you with this attention to the present moment and so basically you can take everything we've talked about just now it's sort of it's sort of a framework through which you can give yourself five minutes each day to put yourself into this mindset through the metaphor of travel as a way to enrich your life as a way to in to experience the other side of the world or to take those lessons learned at the other side of the world and enrich your home life and your home community in a way that makes your home life and community better. And, and so that's it. It's actually a book that came out of the pandemic because when, when, when we couldn't travel, my wife and I would sit on our deck in Kansas and read to each other very short readings of Mary Oliver's poetry or Ryan Holiday's Daily Stoic, these little short meditations. We realized that even in this time of uncertainty, um, centering ourselves each day and having these readings allowed us to to sort of make the most of each day spiritually um, and experientially in a way we wouldn't have had otherwise. And I realized that 20 years after having written Vagabonding, I can sort of give this reader this daily recipe, this short dose of inspiration and meditation each day that they might not otherwise have. And so I took 25 years of, of travel and, and of thinking about travel and obsessing about travel. And I created The Vagabond's Way, which sort of helps the reader think about these things from day to day. You, you, you mentioned how long ago, I hope it doesn't make you feel that old, but you mentioned how long ago you wrote, you wrote that first book, uh, what, back in 2003, I think it was released. Mm. Uh, you know, I, often when I'm speaking to authors or musicians or anyone who puts anything out in the world, it's a snapshot of who they were at the time. Mm. And that, that at the time was, you know, you were a younger man. It was a, it was a post 9-11 world. It was just such, a, it was, 
you know, pre social media and all of that other stuff. How has travel changed for you? And how do you look back on that, that work and that advice compared to taking a snapshot from who you were then to who you are today? Well, I like that I, that I, one, that I wrote that book all the years, all those years ago. And, and two, people still want to talk about it. You know, like I just sent an email to, to a guy this morning who just read it and, and had some questions about things. And it's like, in a way, the the young guy, the 29, 30 year old guy who wrote that book, um, I think sometimes we look back at our younger selves and think, oh, OK, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm further along. Well, my that guy who wrote that book is was pretty smart. You know, he understood things in some ways that I don't give myself permission to understand things now. And so even though the world of travel has changed a bit, I try to hold myself accountable for that idealistic and very travel rich person who wrote that first book, Vagabonding. As travel changed, I think the basic, even though we often operate our travels off of our smartphone now, and actually travel is a lot easier in some ways. I think that that spiritual experiential aspect of travel hasn't changed much in the 20 years since Vagabonding first came out. And so even though I'm an older person now, actually in the new book, I quote uh, Paul Theroux as saying that travel is this experience that sometimes it feels like those those weeks, months, years we spent travel aren't really subtracted from our lives, right? That that time is a different way of living. And so I think that's true. I don't, I, I'm 52 now. Good grief. I turned 52 last <laughs> month. I don't feel 52, you know? Um, I think that sometimes travel is a way of sort of communing with our ageless self. And so I think that's been good for me to have this conversation that has flown out of, flown out of this book and out of trying to hold myself up to the standard that I wrote about 20 years ago, you know, that it was a very idealistic person who wrote that book and I'm trying to keep myself honest. And so it's fun. And so the second book isn't necessarily a sequel to the book. It's, it, it goes deeper where the book, first book was, Vagabonding was an overview. The Vagabond's Way is my fifth book. It goes deeper into each concept of vagabonding. And it was funny in assembling the new book to realize how technologically so much is so different. The idea that your camera is on your phone, which is also your map. Oh my God. You know, the guy who was writing the book in 2002 would have thought, really? Okay. What an interesting future that is. But this, the, the same basic lessons that I was trying to capture in that f- first book still hold true, even as the technological matrix that surrounds us makes it easier to travel and also a little bit harder to fully experience travel. And so it's been fun. It's been it's been, been a fun experience uh, and a conversation with myself, I guess, even as I'm in conversation to the people who've read my books. And that first book was super popular. You know, it's, it's sold in the hundreds of thousands. Uh, and so a lot of people who are reading the new book, they're also in a conversation with my first book, which they, they read earlier. You don't have to necessarily read them in that order, but it's been fun. Uh, almost biographically to look at this thing. You know, I someday in a hundred years, I won't be here anymore, right? It doesn't matter if I, whether or not I feel 52 today because in hundred years, I'm not gonna be here at all. And so that idea, that memento mori idea that I presented in the first book and represented in the, in the new book, the idea of memento mori means remember that you will die. It doesn't mean to be a, need to be a sad, um, morbid thing, but basically just say all the worries, all the cares, all the anxieties that we have now won't matter in a hundred years that we have this life that we're living in this moment. And we should, you know, if we keep thinking about the future, well, eventually the future is going to evolve, evolve us being gone. Right. You know, that when we dance, when we go on a dance floor and we dance the dance, it's not about getting to the end of the dance. It's about enjoying every spin and every move on the dance floor, whether or not dance is your thing. I'm probably a better traveler than I am a dancer, <laughs> but metaphorically, the point of the dance isn't to get the dance over with, you know, it's, it's to, to enjoy every move, as that dance, you don't listen to a symphony to get to the end of the symphony. You enjoy each moment of that symphony. Life is that way too. And so when you remember Memento Mori is a reminder that you'll be dead someday. And so let's make this day count and not relegate things to the future because metaphorically the future will eventually involve your absence from the world. This is what we have, so let's embrace it. (laughs) 